come by the sphere of influence, they also follow the path of wisdom. We think it for ears that listen, for eyes that see, for hearts that is see of what you have to happen. I pray that our new team love for you. The openness of our ears, the readiness of our hearts. I pray that this will not allow the devil to withdraw from our hands in Jesus' name. Help us, Lord, every time that you come before your word, to come with this openness that allows you to give us all that is in your mind in Jesus' name. Help us that we shall not shut off the divine thing. But that Lord will make our hearts and minds constantly open so that the world can flood our hearts and produce life in us in Jesus' name. Speak to us dearly. Especially as we consider this important topic. I pray you help us where we need to learn more wisdom, where we need to pray more, where we need to make corrections. Help us to do just what in Jesus' name. Thank you for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray. Tonight, I'd like to speak to us on character formation in Christian families. I told you when we first had the introduction that this is an issue that demands attention, our attention at this time. Uh, because our church is uh, getting to the second generation. We are having a crop of children that are brought up in our, in our church here. Marriages conducted in this church. And those children are also getting to youthful age. Some of them are even going beyond that. And because of that, uh, it's like the devil knows that. And it's uh, causing a lot of troubles and problems in many Christian families, many homes along this line. That's why uh, it's good. Many times in Revelation, God spoke and Jesus said, He that has here, let him hear uh, what the Spirit is saying to the churches. When we see things happening around us, uh, in various places, many lives and many homes, then we know what the Holy Ghost is talking to the church at this time. For some of you are here, the message I'm preaching, there's no one I believe, there's no one the message is too late for. But then, for some of you, the message might be coming too early. Maybe you feel you don't need it yet, or maybe you don't know where to apply it yet in your life. But something is sure, if Jesus carries in a number of years, you will need what we are learning uh, tonight. That's why it's important. If you cannot apply, if you cannot place it anywhere right now, tuck it somewhere in your heart, tuck it in somewhere, and keep it until the time you will need it. But for those of us who are right in the center of the whole thing at this moment, how God will help us to pay attention in Jesus' name. In Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6. Say now, a child, in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. There are two stages of life given to us here. One, a child. Two, old. That is, that child is old now. But there is a time here when that child is still young. And there is a time when that child still needs training. Then he's telling us there is another time when that child will be old now. And he will be on his own. And he will be the one that will do things himself, uh, take decisions himself, depending on what you have done in him or her. When that child gets to a particular time, now he's got to a point now that he's on his own. But before then, you have a great duty. Train on. A child, train up. Not just train, but train up. That is, you give your training and you watch the effect of your training as it goes on on that child. And as the child is going through various ages and stages of life, you change and you vary your methods of training and your content of training and your approach of training as well as the, uh, the, uh, the resources that you use in your training from time to time. But then, understand that the greatest training program we have is not to train the brain of our children. We have that duty, but more than that. The greatest student, the training work we have is not able to train them in household chores. We need to do that, but that's not the greatest thing we have. But the most important training that we must give to our children is not, uh, you know, human relations, greet people well, and all that. That's like a subset of the main training program we have. It's the character of our children that we need to train. When we train them up and we form their character by the grace of God, it's like we have given them a master key that opens every other door. Whatever training they need, once their character is well formed under God, all other training things will fall into place. That's why we are dealing and focusing at this time on character formation. 
And I didn't call it child training. Because when we just say child training, many people don't know what are we to train the children on. Don't steal, don't fight, don't tell lies. That's okay. But we're talking about the character now. What you know about that child. What the people know about that child. What the world will know about that child. What God will know about that child. What the devil will know about that child. What friends will know about that child. What working colleagues will know about that child. What schoolmates will know about that child. What the community and the neighborhood will know about that child. And the character of that child. Now, character means mental or moral nature. It's like the qualities that make a person different from others. That's what we call the character of a man. Your character is that thing. That mental nature, that moral nature, that makes you to, di- to be different from any other person near you, any other person around you. And parents are God's primary agents in the formation of the ch- character of their children. You as a father, you as a mother, you are God's primary agent. Many times, people are looking towards the church. They think, well, if my child will be good, it's, uh, it depends on what the church is doing at the children's church. It depends on what the church is doing in the youth section. But no, you are God's primary agent in the formation of the character of your children, not the school. I hope there's nobody here who is looking up to the school form the character of his child or a child. I hope there's nobody here. They can help you form the head of your child. They can help you form the intelligence of your child, but not the character of your child. There is no school in this world. But God has equipped and God has given this first and primary assignment of character formation. They may try. You know when you enter into some of these universities and when they are doing graduation, I don't know here, but the one I know, they will say, these people that, you know, the day they are doing their citation, the way they, are, they want to put them, they compile the degree. They say these people have uh, proved themselves in character and in learning or something like that. But really, the majority of those people, all they have learned is just learning. Which lecturer says to the character of the, uh, of the university student? What's his business about that? All he cares for is, you know, I give my lecture and I go my way. So, it's not the school. And it's not even the church. And it's not even the community. And I need to also add, it's not the grandfather or the grandmother that God has given the primary duty of the character formation of your children. Not your younger brother. Not your younger sister. It's, a, it's unfortunate. You find some, some believers, maybe because they're not they're ignorant, they leave the formation of the character of their child on a fellow sister or a fellow brother, maybe their uh, fellow, uh, maybe uh, their elder sister, elder brother, cousin. You see, those people are Christians, and I've seen their their own children are well formed, and I've seen that their children are in fact the children from that family. They are wonderful children. They are good Christians. Can I tell you, God has not equipped those that family for the formation of the character of your own child. God has equipped that father and that mother for the formation of the character of his own child. Not your own. And so you say, oh, the children in that family, they, in fact, they are a challenge. Because of that, I give my own child also there. You fail. Because the equipping God has given that man is to suit the temperament of his own children, the foundation he has made in the life of his own children. And if you leave the formation of the character of your own child in the hand of anybody, I'm not talking about my child goes to visit this family now, or my child goes to see that Christian family, spend a week, spend two weeks, or something. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about you now. Say, well, you know, I'm not available. And I don't have too much time. And I'm busy. Therefore, I'll give my child to one uh, auntie somewhere, one sister something somewhere, who is also a Christian. In fact, a deeper life. He's also this and that. And he is the one that will help me form the character of my child. You made a mistake. God has not equipped you to do that. You are God's primary agent in the formation of the character of your children. Church leaders and school teachers, they are secondary agents. Characters that are patched up and painted over we soon we soon show telltale signs of moral collapse, spiritual collapse, in the face of moderate pressure. You see, when uh, sometimes somebody is building a house and then there is a crack, they have built that house, they have not even plastered it, and then they see that there is a crack somewhere. And instead of going to the foundation and making sure that they check up and if they need to do something more than what they have done, they say, okay, okay, let's just patch it, and then they take this cement and patch that thing. And then, over time, maybe they are even painted now, they are now in the last. Over time, that crack will appear again. And I told you two weeks ago when we had the first uh, uh, the introduction, I told you that there are many, many things you see now. And we didn't know this years ago, but now we know that some of the children, some of our youths, 
some of the people associated with this church 10 years ago, 12 years ago, 15 years ago, 17 years ago, and now they are getting to, you know, middle, uh, they are getting to young adulthood. And we are seeing that really what we thought was a fine, beautiful building many years ago actually was a wretched building patched over. And we just uh, patched it and then painted it. But once you manage that, you will see that with time, the signs will still come up, the things will still appear. Eventually, you will still see that the crack will still show up later. And so you find that under, in the face of moderate pressure, maybe a little pressure in the school, a little pressure in the uh, community, a little pressure in, in the street, in the neighborhood where they are living, and you will see that what you never could imagine those children will do, what you never could imagine those children will say, what you never could imagine those children will put up as action, they begin to do it. The things you never could imagine they will say, they begin to say, it. the reason is that when they first showed you what you call telltale signs, when they first showed you that thing, you didn't do a thorough work. You just patched it over and painted it over. And then we continue with all, here is deeper life child, deeper life youth, deeper life uh, 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 you know, of tomorrow and all that. But eventually, the signs begin to show. And so you find that as you are getting to middle age, a lot of Christian parents are having problems with children brought up in our church. And a lot of people uh, even have, even have to be disciplined because of children, you know, brought up in the church. And some others who are not disciplined well, those children are a problem. And some of those uh, people, if they are sincere, they will know that even the child, the life of the child and everything is a serious discouragement to those parents because the patches that were made many years ago, they are showing again. Satan's plot against our children and against our youth, is, it will fall flat. The plot of Satan will fall flat. But we need the grace of God to build strong Christian virtues and godly character into our children. It's never too late to start. It's never too late. I don't believe, my people. I don't believe that a child comes out of you can get to a point while a child is still under your under your leadership. Maybe living with you, but we still look up to you for food, for money, for uh, you know, well being up keep. And I will now say, well, I cannot handle that. Right? Yes, I know the man says, turn up with chasing that side of hope. But uh, there is no more hope only when that child now, he said, maybe I now become a father, a mother now, maybe that's, there's no hope at that time. But as long as that child is still under your influence, it's never too late. You can still start. To accomplish this, the process of building godly character in today, we must know the process of character development. And that's my point number one. The process of character development. Point number two, parental participation in character determination. Parental participation in character determination. That is, in determining the character of our children, what the path we have as parents. Point number three, the partnerships in character development. Partnerships in character development. Every parent needs to know this. <laughs> As if you are going to build up godly character in your child, you can't do it alone. You need partnership. That's why there is a father and there is a mother. If you want to bring life into a place like this, there are two wires, the negative and the positive. And if you want to build up godly children, there is a father and there is a mother. So then you say, how about those who are single parents? How about those who are maybe leaders? How about those whose husbands are not even born again? That's not all. We have father mother partnership. We also have parent God partnership. And so these are the partnerships in God in character development. I pray the Lord will help us. As we play our part, God will play his own part and share. And I know that our children will be godly. Whether the devil likes it or not, their character will fall in line with the will of God with Jesus' name. But then, the process now of character development. In Proverbs chapter 23, Proverbs chapter 23, and verse 7. For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Let's stop there. Here we are given a major key in character development. And it tells us that the foundational thing in character development is the thought line. Because as he thinks to his heart, so he thinks. That is to say, the thought processes, the thought line, is a very, very powerful force 
is the character of an individual. The way a man thinks is the way a man appears. Your thought makes you. So you find here it tells us, as that boy, as that girl, as that young boy or girl, as that adult, think. The, the thought process is the thought pattern determining the character type that person has. But then I need to tell you, before we talk about character development, so that you don't make a mistake. We are not talking, character is not temperament. There is a world of difference between character and temperament. Temperament is inborn. Whatever a child's temperamental makeup is, it can be made into an upright character. God has not given us as parents the impossible task of temperamental change. It's an impossible task. A task that God has given you is not temperamental formation. The task God has given you is character formation. Temperament is inborn. And we cannot change or form temperament. But we can form, we can change character. Now, we need to understand that whatever temperament people may have, the task God has given you as a child, no matter the temperament of your child, the path, the, the task God has given you as a child is to form that child, irrespective of the temperament, to form him into a godly character. Now, so that I will be as practical as possible, I don't want to be telling you these are the different temperamental sides. There are two kinds of them. But then, let me tell you that, of course, you know that Jesus realized that Peter was completely different from Philip. And Jesus never made any attempt to alter the temperament of Peter. That was, that would be impossible. And Jesus allowed Peter to be Peter. And he cried, realized, you know the way he talked to Peter? You know the way he dealt with Peter? You know the kind of one Peter was? It's a very, very strong, real person. And Jesus realized there was a kind of temperamental style behind that kind of man. That's why Jesus did something that shocked Peter. Have you realized the way Jesus dealt with Peter? Have you realized that some of his hardest messages were preached to Peter? Not because of the kind of temperament Peter had. Peter had a temperament that was very volatile. A man that was very mature. A man that, uh, to be, uh, he talks, he's a fast person. He's uh, very obedient, he's a man that is outgoing. Uh, I don't want to uh, tell you that Peter was this kind of character temperament and temperamental style because yeah, there's nobody who is completely one temperament. Nobody is 100% melancholic. No, that is somebody who is just quiet, doesn't meet with anybody, he doesn't smile, or they, not that he has hatred, but he's just not the cheerful type. It's a dark personality, not dark in character, but dark temperament. It's not the colorful type. Peter was the colorful type. But there are other people that are not the very colorful type. And Jesus knew that. And he knows the way he dealt with Peter. You know the way he said something to Peter that if he said it to some of the other disciples, they almost think that there was hope, no more hope for them. Suppose Jesus says, John the Beloved. And he said, Get me behind me, Satan. So Please, John is likely to feel. So I'm as bad as that. Somebody who thinks introspectively. Peter is not an introspective person. Peter is not somebody who will sit down and begin to think inside and be thinking. Peter is somebody who is more outgoing, who is more outward thinking. Now, our children, I use that example to explain what I need the temperament for you. Don't mix temperament with character. And there are many of us saying the problem with us. We leave what we should do, we are facing what we shouldn't do. We are trying to change the temperament of our children. They are going. Why are you always keeping quiet? Why are you always inside your chair? Why are you always uh, locking the door? Why are you always inside? Temperament, that's temperament. That's not his personality, that's not his character. And if you don't know that, you will leave the main thing and the beginning is not essential. Somebody can be a reckless and still be a holy, saintly, upright, dependable person. Somebody can be outgoing, vocal, and he doesn't hide his feelings, he doesn't speak. He says what he feels, the way he feels it, and he can still be a holy, godly, saintly, uh, upright, and dependable character. So, it's not the temperament, it is the character. So, as parents, God has not given us the task, because it will be difficult. But, he has given us the task of character formation. And as we think about this task, we need to understand that a child's character is not formed over man. Character is not something you form, 
you will overnight. Uh, today it's like this, then tomorrow it's like another one. No. Uh, that is something that is a long process. That's why we call it the process of character development. So, one, it is form. God has mercy on you if you want to change it. Difficult. That's the problem many of us are having. We waited two days. And now, the character has been formed. And it's now a problem. We want to change it. The time we should have done drastic work on the child. We didn't do it. The child we should have been drastic and, if possible, surgical. You know, our doctors were here. And they say that when you discover cancer, for example, the first, uh, the moment you discover it uh, in the early stages, they do a drastic kind of operation. They cut that place of the cancer. Not only that, if necessary, the surrounding anywhere they think that the thing has, uh, you know, metastasized and got into, they cut off everything in such a way that it's just the, the chances of the thing going further, they do a drastic, that's why they say drastic disease. So, when we don't do that, and we now wait until the character personality is formed, and now we want to do drastic disease. You know there is a kind of drastic disease that it has gone so far that if you are going to do drastic cure, that, may, that person will die. So they say, okay, we, uh, we have got to this side, but that other side, if we go there, that person will not come back uh, after the operation. So we will leave that one. And so they will say, okay, well, maybe without your chances of maybe another five years, ten years, and all that, maybe we will survive for ten years. After that, maybe we will die. So it's because the drastic cure does not handle the disease anymore to me. I pray that the kind of spiritual disease that is impossible to cure in our children will not happen in Jesus' name. But then, for it not to happen, we have work to do in Jeremiah chapter 13. Jeremiah chapter 13. And verse 23. See, he will be a He says, Can the Ethiopian change it? Hmm? If you don't understand that, let me say it like this. Can an African change his skin? Yeah? The cosmetic industry they are found. But they cannot succeed. Can the Ethiopian change his skin? Or the leopard is spot? Is it possible for a leopard? The spot that had been formed, that had been that had entered that was in his blood. That God created there and put there, and nobody can remove it. Can that spot now be clean, and you now have a leopard without any skin, any spot on his skin? God said, if that is possible, then may you also do this. Those of you that are accustomed, mark that way, accustomed. Accustomed. That means, over time, over a long period of time, it has become second nature, accustomed to doing this. They were not born evil. Because if they are born evil, there will not be any customization there. But you see, you are accustomed. That means you are in the habit. Your habit has been formed. Your lifestyle has been formed. Everything about these people has been formed. So they don't know how to do any other thing except evil. When you get to that point, you will only try if you want to change personality, you will be using in the You will try, but you will really succeed. I pray God will help you to be wise to the development. Now, the process of character development is something we need to understand. So that it will help us how to deal with the character flaws that arise in our children and even in our converts to each other. Now, it's not so difficult, but it's deep and profound. I need to repeat that the character is not something you form overnight. It starts, number one, with thought. As a man thinks carefully fast, so he sees thought. And as you think about thought, the thought of a child are formed by something. One, the environment around that child. Two, the relationship around that child. So, when we say character develops start from thought, thought itself is formed by the environment and by the relationship. Understand, when we say thought, that means the thought pattern, the thinking pattern of that child, the, the thought behavior, the thought processes of that child, the way that child thinks perpetually and constantly. I'm not talking about thoughts that Satan throws into the heart of people, you know, occasionally. I'm talking about the consistent thought 
pattern of a child. It's determined, number one, by the environment of that child. The home environment, the spiritual environment, the moral environment around that child. That's why we are telling you on our, our deeper life people, all these uh, people who are asking, they want to live deeper life because television, they want to uh, go to another church because they don't allow them to watch this, they don't allow them to do that. Do you mean that you don't know that the first pattern of your children are formed by the kind of environment they're exposed to? And once the first pattern is formed in a particular direction, yeah, it's, it's, like a, it's like a train track. I'm sure you know the, the, the way it's uh, this uh, way. When you know the thing gets on that thing, it has to keep on following you. And that's why the thought pattern is, is important. If you want to develop the character of your children, then take, take care of the environment. The environment will uh, influence your thought, the influence the influence, the thought will influence other things that I'll tell you about. And that's why when the environment is polluted, when the environment is defiled, when the environment is unclean, those things live in tenement houses where, you know, uh, this one has its own house, that one has its own room and all that, and the children are all there like that, check out the children from that kind of place. You will see that all the children tend to follow a particular pattern, and you know the pattern? The pattern is the pattern of the dominant personality, the dominant child in that house. And that dominant child will be the one that will be forming, un- unknown to live in the place, they're forming the character of that child. That's why in the school, when you find that our children go to school, and we don't check up and ask questions and, you know, check up on them and catechize them and ask them questions here and there. There may be a dominant personality in their school, in their class. It's not their friend, not that they are a friend with him, but that person is very strong. And if this child is the uh, winning child, the one that means more, and now it leans on that dominant personality, and that dominant personality will be telling that child, you will do this, you will do that. And there are children that will go home and steal their father's money because this dominant personality told them, bring money tomorrow. You hear? And so you find that when we understand that, that the thought process, that the first thing we must deal with, and to deal with the thought process, deal with the environment. When I say environment, I'm not talking about planting flowers and uh, planting garlic. I'm talking about the moral environment of the child, the home environment of the child. When the child, when the uh, uh, home, when the Christian virtues are not being lived out in the life of the father and the mother, no way the trap will stay in the thoughts of those children. When the parents in the home environment, when their convictions on Christian life and Christian practice is not strong, when you yourself you are not strong in your conviction and persuasion about the various issues of the Christian life, Somehow, you don't know it affects the thought pattern of your children. When they see in you any kind of, uh, any kind of, uh, any kind of reservation about anything, no matter how small or how slight it may be, it affects the thought pattern of those children. So, to start with, the thought pattern affected by environment, not only that, affected by relationship. Relationship between you and them, Relationship between what they call peer group, them and they and their friends. Oh, how important that is. Relationship. Relationship. Relationship between you and your child. And there are parents that are strangers to their children. They don't discuss to that child. They don't talk to that child. They don't discuss. They don't, they don't look that child in the eye. And talk to him. And talk to her. Sometimes like a friend. And try to let that child know that there is a strong bond between you and him, between you and her. And when you don't do that, it affects their thought pattern because it means that I don't have love, acceptance, at all. to do you for it elsewhere. And one thing leads to another until God forbid that child is loved. So, you find that relationship, environment, determines the thought pattern. The pictures you want, the pictures you I make available today, the things you expose them to, it affects their thought pattern. So, to start with, you need to, and I cannot talk too much about this area of thought, because that's the foundation of the whole problem. Because as you think that in the heart, so it is. And the thought pattern of our children, very important, and of course unknown to many of us, you can know the thought of those children when they ask questions, when they talk, when they make contributions, anything they say, because they are still play, they are, they are not yet wily, they are not yet crafty, they are play, whatever they say, can easily, you can easily understand their thought pattern, from the words they speak out. But when we don't listen, or when we hear, we don't listen. You know, there's different between hearing and listening. You can hear something, but you're not listening with insight. Remember again, insight 
foresight, sight, insight, foresight. That you listen with insight. What you hear, one. And then, what you make of what you hear, two. And sometimes those kids, they, because they are guileless, they betray their thought pattern easily. A child comes to you and you say, uh, Daddy, but teach me, uh, Daddy, or something. Is it compulsory? Are you telling me that there is no way anybody who does not, uh, who uses your name, just an example, will go to hell? Do you mean that, uh, what I are saying is that all those people who are Christians in our, uh, who say they are Christians in our school, and they, and they have to listen and say, are you saying that they will go to hell? Now, you just say, uh, you, you know that it's not worth it. You answer the question quite well, but you don't answer the thought behind the question. Because what happens is that there is some doubt in his heart. So, is it mean when we are telling the question? Is it possible? Or oh, am I not being denied something that I have to have? But they might come to you and they say, Do you mean that uh, just dress to a The dress one wears and you can take one to her? And you say, Well, uh, if one is born again, and you, they, 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 the way they pray me, some of them, they will say, you mean that if somebody is born again, and it's just because of maybe wearing a, a particular kind of dress, that's why that person will not go to heaven. And you don't, you answer the question, you say, well, this is what the Bible teaches that Christian dressing, a believer to dress like this, a believer to dress like that. You have answered the question, but the thought behind this, you have not answered. Because the thought behind this now is, if there is one day, is it just, can God do it because of mere dressing, send someone to hell? And you, and you, and then if you are a parent who has insight, and I'm just going to answer that question, you are going to now tell that child that there have been people in the Bible who got rejected because of small, small, so tiny deviation from what God has told them. That God doesn't agree, he doesn't accept deviation. And then you, you'll be telling that a person like Moses, you say, look at Moses. He didn't do all the evil those people did. He just said, God says, speak to the earth and just do that all. When you, when you answer the question, and then you go beyond answering the question. So let the child know that the little thought you are thinking, that uh, maybe this is not important, be careful because little deviations, God has rejected people because they before, because of little thoughts to slide what you think is small. Now, you answer the question, then you put the fear of God in the other side of the me. It means that you can just give you a little thing. That's what you're going to do. You forget about that thing now. He's not thinking about any slight deviation from what you are talking, the word of God. That doesn't mean you will not come and ask you another question later, but the foundation you have told you, you have given me, on this is thought pattern. That thing will be man- controlling thought, thought life. And so it's good to be having a kind of mindset that God does not tolerate deviation. So, when we are talking about thought, our children have thought pattern. And sometimes those of them who are seeing you guys, they will ask you questions. Those of you are there. So they might, might ask you questions, and they might, they might say, for example, that, you know, daddy, um, I want to know, when you were a teenager, what do you, uh, were you born again that time? Uh, when did you give your life to Christ? And then you tell them, how about when you were a teenager, how was it? I just want to know, I just want to know. Now, do you think asking that question? You just answer the question, well, you know, at that time I was not born again, and, uh, you know, I, uh, I was not born again at that time. But thank God I was born again, I'm born again. The child is asking the question, not because he just wants to know when you are born again. Maybe he's asking because he's one day. Why don't I wait until I become what that day I become? Because I also start thinking, because I'm suffering. See all my friends in the school. See the way they, see how they, see how things are in there. See how it's like I'm suffering. After all, my daddy is there. So that's why we should not just hear, we should listen. Now, thought influenced by environment and relationship. But as we have understood that now, let's understand that the character begins with thought. Then, consistent thought patterns lead to action. A consistent thought pattern leads to action. You remember what the Word of God uh, says? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. That's just speaking. But not only the mouth speaks too. Out of the abundance of the heart, the legs walk. Out of the abundance of the heart, the eyes look. Out of the abundance of the heart, the uh, everything that a man does is done. Because Jesus told us in Matthew, uh, Mark 7, 21, you know, 21 to 23, that out of the heart to see, then you begin to mention all those things. That means that consistent thought pattern 
consistent thought pattern, consistent thought pattern, eventually leads to a kind of pattern. That is why you don't want to help the of your children. It is easier for you to start a top point, the top level. Don't get to the top level. If you can, if God can help you, stop this at top level before you get action level. Action level is even still okay. I'm getting to the other level to be very difficult. But already, when you have a thought pattern, it's easy to control the action. And so, consistent thought pattern leads to action. Now, the next level now. Repeat action leads to happy formation. Instead, action leads to happy formation. So, how important that is. That is why. And I get to point to the God and life here. I'll be talking about this. That's why the least deviation in any time to be dealt with drastically. Don't say it's just a little deviation or a small deviation because if he does that action or put up that act and you sit there and you put it up again, by the time he repeats you, the first time he did you, it was just an action. By the time he does it the third time, it has become a habit. See where we started. We started from thought, we have got a habit now. So, when, 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 when you see the act that are put up, you remember it's coming from the thought, and the thought is coming from the environment and coming from the uh, relationship. And so you see, the habit, the repeated action, when they are repeated again and again, they lead to habit formation. And now, the next level now, habit. When it becomes a habit, translate the character. Habit, when it becomes a habit, it now becomes the character. And you can see this process that I'm, I'm giving you now. It applies to both negative and positive character. Think of good character in the life of our children. How does it start? So, so. So, that's why we teach them Bible, we teach them a song, we teach them this and that. So, good character begins with thought. Evil character also begins with thought. So, this process applies to both negative and positive character habits, character traits. So, I said, habits when it becomes established, lead to character. And then, character now is the force behind a person's lifestyle. Character now is the force that lies behind the person's lifestyle. The character a man has will lead to the kind of lifestyle he will live. And then it's talking about the lifestyle determining the person's destiny. See where we started from. We like the right then to say a thought pattern determining the person's destiny. But that's, that's where it enters. It starts with thought and it ends with heaven or hell. Mind. Maybe you think it appears to you that this child has told a lie. And maybe it's not actually a lie. Maybe it's just that you mis miscalculated something or whatever. But because he was under pressure and he said something, and to you it appears to be a lie. It's better you check it up and be sure that actually it was not a lie. It was like maybe uh, he didn't have uh, good information or he made a mistake. He, he, he didn't calculate something well or something like that. Rather than you assume for him, don't assume for your children. <laughs> yeah, you know, many things. I think we will need to continue next week. Because the, the more I talk and think about this thing, the deeper it's getting. You know many parents we just assume? We assume for them. We make excuse for the child. Don't make excuse for your child. Let the facts prove that, okay, the fact, let the facts excuse him. Don't excuse him yourself. Let, for example, maybe a child tells you, oh, I... Uh, when I went to take uh, money uh, in the place you asked me to take money, then I, I, I met uh, two, uh, 250 there, and I took uh, 170 that you asked me to take. Yeah. But when you got there, you found out that when you take 170 out of 250, how much will you find on the table? You should find 18 hours. But when you got there, actually you found maybe 49. Don't assume and say 
Don't let the facts prove it. Don't as you know, okay, maybe uh, maybe it was not two fifty that was actually maybe I made this thing, maybe it was actually two ten. And maybe I just made this thing. No. That's not how to do it. Character development. I'm going to call that child. And I'm going to ask questions. Let the facts prove your excuse. Don't make the excuse. Because you may think and maybe the child didn't even steal money. Maybe just it didn't count well and you took more than you should have taken. But if you didn't check up and you just keep quiet and the child also keeps quiet, the devil might say, Isn't that wonderful? God must know that you know this man. Ah, if, if, and don't forget that the devil, and he tempted Jesus and he quoted the Bible to him, that if, if it was not, if God didn't want you to have this money, even your dad, you know that he doesn't make mistake, you would have known that, the God, was, don't spend the money, you wait till tomorrow. And the child will not spend the money, but will not tell you, will not put it in the pocket. And then, you see, uh, when tomorrow comes, don't spend it, wait for another day. By the time the child waits for three days, you see, if God has given you the money, go ahead and spend the money. Well, if you are checked up, the child started with a mistake of taking more than you asked him to take. Not that he wanted to steal the money, but he ends up with a sin. But you should have helped him to cut off the sin, and limit it to the mistake level if you are checked up. But you make a uh, zoo. You say, ah, I know him, my child. Never, never, can never steal. Uh, he can never steal, he can make a mistake. Has it not happened to you before that somebody gave you money? And, or maybe you gave somebody money and you say, it's 2,500 that is there. And then when they are counting you, somehow you find maybe 2,300. Did you steal? No. What? You take up the head. And it can happen to them too. So, that's why we spot the first cracks and deal with it decisively and without any without any reservation and do it very very well now let's uh, this uh, other things I will leave it till next week I want to give you I don't want to give you too much about this but my brothers my sisters look up here there are many reasons why your own children particularly must not go bad number one what are you going to tell God that you give with all the knowledge you had in the Bible. What are you going to tell God that He entrusted children in your hand and you messed them up? What are you going to tell the world? You know you have deeper life. And then what are you going to tell the church who trusted you with leadership? Because your life as a Christian and your family life and the children's life and everything, they are all entwined together. You can't remove one. You know the other. If any child must go bad, your own children must not go bad. You can't afford it. It's too expensive for you to do. Rise up and let us pray. can tell when it will come to your turn to need, to need all these things we're talking about. Maybe you are right in the center of it now. And we can still start again. We can call those children again and say, son, daughter, I want to start a new syllabus. And you will please cooperate with me. Of course we need to love those children. I will talk about that when God allows next time. But understand that those children that's your future. You particularly, your children must not go bad. Your children must not go bad. You particularly, <laughs> because the devil hates you. You are doing him havoc, you are causing him trouble. And you say, but my children, there are other children in the world. Can you compare your children with other children? Is your family, is, are those other families important to Satan? Don't you know when you are important to God, you are important to the devil? Don't you know the devil hates you specially? He hates you, he hates you, he hates you, he hates you. He hates you, he hates you, he hates anybody about you, anything about you, anything about you, anything around you, anything coming from you. He hates and hates and hates you. That's why you must not give him any hope. Any hope. And he say, but there are other children in town. Oh yes, the parents of those other children, they are not like you. 
the parents of those other children, they are not giving Satan trouble. They are not giving Satan headache. The parents of those other children, they are, they are already in the devil's back. And if they are already in the devil's back, you are you that you are a, a Satan tormentor. What do you think the devil will think about you? What do you think Satan will think about you? What do you think Satan will love to do about you? You particularly, you particularly, your children must not go through it. 